Greetings. Shabbat Shalom. We're in the afterglow of uh, Purim. So if you if you are among those who celebrate Purim, we hope that your festivities went well. I want to clarify something from last week. Uh, I want to clarify that according to the Bible, Mordecai uh, had adopted his uncle's daughter, which made him her cousin. So uh, a couple of times I call her her I call him her uncle. I should have said her cousin. You know, as I'm getting older, I'm thinking more about the hereafter. I go into a room and I and I wonder, what am I here after? So uh, maybe that's why I made that mistake last week. I hope not. I want to ask you to um, keep in mind uh, as you hear about what goes on in the world, because you know this is not the millennium, and we have natural disasters. Uh, we've had problems in uh, the southeastern U.S. around Alabama and um, southeastern Africa has had very severe trouble, uh, weather trouble there. And in the middle, mid-America, in the Midwest, uh, there's been flooding uh, there. So please keep in mind, as you hear of events, you know, pray about uh, those situations. I appreciate the fact that uh, we have had over the years viewers from all over the world. I want to give a shout out today to uh, Charles City, Iowa. So anybody watching us in Chucktown, uh, hello out there. I have a uh, neighbor who needs your prayers, speaking about praying, um, Carol Mazuka. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name correctly, uh, but the Carol Mazuka <clears throat> is um, a senior citizen who's had, had some health issues, and uh, she's a, they were sending her to a rehab facility, but she could be cared for in her home. The problem is that she's in, in a weakened condition right now where she can't walk, so pray that she could be sufficiently uh, strengthened, you know, that God would intervene and give her sufficient strength so that she could, you know, walk out of that rehab center and, and uh, you know, and go home and uh, take, you know, take it from there. So I want to ask for your prayers uh, for the healing and strengthening of uh, Carol Mazuka, who's a, a neighbor of ours. When we pray, uh, if we're Christians, we understand that we can pray uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if we are committed Christians, if we have gone through the process of conversion, then we have repented of our sins. We've been baptized. We've had hands laid on us for the receipt of God's Spirit. Now, these are ritualistic uh, things that, were, that are required of us, if, if at all possible. Uh, of course, God isn't, you know, limited by by those procedures, but that is the those are the appropriate procedures. But when I've counseled people for baptism, you know, I've told them that <laughs> that they're going to be accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, their Lord and Master, their High Priest, and soon and their and their I used to say soon coming King. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope I, I I believe certainly relatively soon when you can look back on on history. Jesus Christ is our coming king and hopefully our soon coming king. But where people are quite a little bit murky is what do we mean that Jesus Christ is our high priest? Uh, well, if you look back at, at the Bible, I want to go back to the festival of Purim. And it's interesting. Purim means, it comes from the Persian, a, a, a word in the Medo-Persian region that meant like, give it the lot. You know, lots were, were cast by Haman. Uh, to see what day he wanted to destroy uh, all the Jews. <clears throat> but it's interesting that if we go back to the Day of Atonement, it's called in the Bible Yom Kippurim, Day of Atonement. Now uh, it, it's become it's become popular in, in Hebrew to call it Yom Yom Kippur, and in America we say Yom Kippur. Uh, but uh, but if you look at the at the Bible, uh, the, the form is Yom Kippurim, Day of Day of Atonement, and. Uh, it's interesting that it's almost exactly like saying Yom Kippurim 
a day like Purim. And in, in what way is the Day of Atonement like, like the Day of Purim? Uh, well, for one thing, both involve the casting of lots. In the case of the Day of Atonement, a lot, lot, lots are cast to determine which goat is sacrificed uh, as a type of Jesus Christ and which goat, goat goes out to, as the Azazel goat, the scapegoat, uh, is, uh, is symbolic of, of Satan. But also another thing about Yom Kippur and Purim is that uh, on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, uh, Yom Kippur uh, the Day of Atonement, we are perhaps at our least physical. <laughs> you know, we, we, we are not eating, we are not drinking. Um, on the other hand, Purim uh, has become a, a, a great day of, fest, of, of feasting, a very merry day and if you look at the at the bible what it says about purim uh it's it's a, just about the opposite of, of 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 the day of atonement in terms of the behavior so they're like uh they're like contrasting days each has a special significance uh but in in terms of the day of atonement there we have the activities of the high priest and the high priest performs certain rituals which really are a type of God's plan of salvation and of what you, we might call salvation history. The high priest was the one who, whose rituals reconciled the people of Israel to their God from year to year. Uh, he was like a marriage counselor. You have the wife who has been a, 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 a not a good wife, <laughs> and the husband loves the wife, but the wife has really fallen down on the job. And so the high priest, as the marriage counselor, brings them together and uh, helps them to patch things over and reconcile and stay together, you know, for, for another year. You know, the high priest is our intercessor uh, uh, between us and, and, and the Almighty. And this is the role that Jesus Christ play, uh, plays in, in our lives. He is our, our intercessor. He is, he is our, our high priest because he, he is the one who took upon himself the penalty for our sins. And so because he did that, we can now come before God and we can have access to God in a very special way because of what Jesus Christ uh, did for us. And uh, I want to go to uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, to the sixth chapter of Hebrews, and it talks about the hope that we Christians have. And of course, that hope very much is focused on the, the role Jesus Christ plays in God's plan of salvation. So Jesus Christ, yes, he is the Mashiach. He is the anointed one. He is the Christos. He is the Christ, the anointed one. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. But he is also our high priest. So our coming king is our high priest. And we're less than a month from the days of unleavened bread. We're less than a month from the New Testament Passover, the Lord's Supper. Communion, Eucharist. Uh, we're we're only we're less than a month from that time, and so we we need to, in our self-examination, uh, as we do that, uh, we have uh, our spring cleaning, physically and spiritually. Uh, as we do that, we can focus also on Jesus Christ as our High Priest, and in Hebrews uh, six, talking about the hope of a Christian. Uh, this hope we have, verse 19 of Hebrews 6, we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. As you understand, the Holy of Holies, the Heavenly Holy of Holies, verse 20, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Oh, you see, Jesus Christ is of the of the he's the Lion of Judah. He's Davidic. But to be a priest uh, in the old covenant, you needed to be a descendant of Aaron. The, the The Levites were 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 those who ministered to the people, and one branch, the family of Aaron, were to be the the priests. And you have an Aaronite speaking to you now, for that matter. But in the millennium, it's not only it's not going to be the Aaronites, but specifically the Zadokite branch of the Aaronites. It's going to be even more specific. So in the millennium, there will be a temple, a millennial temple, and there will be Levites serving there. And among them will be descendants of Aaron, but among them will be the descendants of Zadok, who goes back uh, to Phineas. 
if you remember Phineas in Numbers 25, and the Zedekites will be the priests in the millennium. On the other hand, the great high priest, not of, of Israel, but of all people, will be Jesus Christ, and he's going to be high priest, uh, as the Bible says here, according to the order of Melchizedek. So he is both king and priest. And David was, it was somewhat like that, but David couldn't fully be a priest because he was not Aaronic, he was not Levitical, but he did organize the temple system. He was the closest thing in a way to, uh, at least, to a, well, I shouldn't say the closest thing. Others uh, tried to assume that role later. He was the best example, I guess you could say, of one who was king and priest, although he was not really uh, a, a exactly priest, because, as I said, it had to, it had to be a, a, a Levite of the family of Aaron to be a priest. Jesus Christ, however, is our the universal high priest for all humankind. And his priesthood supersedes the Aaronic priesthood. That is to say, what is critically important for everybody, Jew and Gentile, is uh, Israelite and Gentile, I should say, to be more uh, more precise. What is, what is universal for all is the priesthood of Jesus Christ, which is the Melchizedek priesthood, not the Aaronic priesthood priesthood or Zadokite priesthood, uh, which we read about as well. Uh, I want to go back now to Genesis 14, to the, you know, the first book of the Bible. And, you know, in the ancient Middle East, spring was the season for war. Not too hot, not too cold, not too wet, not too dry. The ideal season for waging war was in the Middle East, was uh, spring uh, in ancient, uh, in the ancient Middle East. And uh, we have a war in Genesis 14, and God miraculously delivers Abraham and his family. And in Genesis 14, it's very likely to spring. And uh, Abraham comes, and uh, in verse um, 18 of Genesis 14, when Abraham, victorious Abraham returns, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. So here we have the spring of the year, most likely, and we have a king who's called Melchizedek, king of righteousness, uh, and he's king of Salem. Ha, you know, shalom, peace, king of peace. Uh, so evidently he was uh, king of Jerusalem. And But if we, we keep reading, it says he brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, El Elyon, God Most High. So he was a king and a priest, and his name meant king of righteousness, uh, king of peace, and he was the king of peace, and he was a priest of God Most High, and he brought out bread and wine. <laughs> so you see, all the way back in Genesis, you see the forerunner of the ceremony that we're going to be conducting, uh, God willing, in, in less than a month. And uh, he blessed Abraham. So he evidently was one who, that Abraham acknowledged as spiritually, in a way, his superior. He was, in some regard, a priest for Abraham. So here we have this Gentile, uh, you know, because we don't... <laughs> Abraham is the grandfather of Jacob, who is the, um, you know, the father of the Israelite people. So here we have a, a Melchizedek and... Uh, we don't know uh, his background. It's deliberately not here. You know, the uh, traditional Jewish belief was that he, he this is Shem, but this doesn't say that here. Um, and so we don't have, and not only that, but we don't know when he was born. We don't know when he died. We, you know, he just mysteriously appears. And there's a reason for that, because he's used here as a type. Uh, so this this king, this great priest and king in the, in the days of ancient Canaan, uh, before the Canaanites really deteriorated and, you know, it, it, it took time for them to, to, to really become as, as corrupt as they became. This was a time when, when things were better, uh, spiritually speaking, in that area. So anyway, he was king of Salem. He brought out bread and wine. He was priest of, the, of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So perhaps he uh, engaged in what might be called monolatry, uh, maybe not pure monotheism, but maybe monolatry, where he recognized that it, it, where in his mind he was in an environment where people uh, worship many gods, and perhaps he, he was willing to acknowledge maybe there are others, but there's only one that ought to be worshipped the Most High God. He worshipped the Most High God. So 
uh, he was the, you know, perhaps he did worship, perhaps he was a monotheist, uh, and, and, but in, in the way the Canaanites viewed the world, because they, they were polytheistic, uh, or in many, perhaps henotheistic, where they, they had other gods, but there were other gods, but certain clans were worshipped one particular one. That's another uh, way to look at it. But the, the, perhaps they, e even though they were in a polytheistic, polytheistic society, Melchizedek said, "I'm the the uh, king of the, the priest of the Most High God, who is of course you know really the one God." And perhaps Mel and Melchizedek did acknowledge that, uh, and so he was a worshiper of of God. He was a worshiper of the God of Abraham. <clears throat> and so he, uh, Abraham had a relationship with him where he could bless Abraham as Abraham's priest. And he was evidently conducting a work, God's work at that time. Abraham was as well. And so evidently there was a relationship there. And that may have continued for a period of time. Uh, and maybe even more than one generation. I'll say more about that in a moment. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Now notice what happens. And he gave him a tithe of all. Oh, so here's the father of all those who believe. You know, the father of the Abrahamic uh, faiths, the monotheistic religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And from the point of view of those in God's church, he's the father of those who believe. Uh, and, you know, the ancestor, uh, humanly speaking, of Jesus Christ, the ancestor of the uh, people of Israel, God's old, old covenant congregation, and the nation which will be the first converted nation in, in the millennium. And he gave a tithe to this Melchizedek. And as I said, it, uh, the relationship perhaps continued, because as we go to Genesis 28, we find um, that Jacob was hoping, it, had had an interaction with, with, with God and um, with angels, and in verse 22 of Genesis 28, uh, he, he talked about establishing a monument, uh, but he also talked about the fact that when he came back from this trip, he didn't know he was going to be gone 40 years. Uh, but when he came back from this flight to uh, to his fam uh, his, to his relatives uh, up north, you know that when he came back, he hoped that God would prosper him and he would come back a prosperous person, and then he was going to give a tithe to God. And so, uh, what what would that mean? What would the significance be of giving a tithe? To whom would he tithe? Well, of course, Abraham was his grandfather. Isaac was his was his father. Um, Isaac was alive at this time and um, could be could have been conducting a work and but also Melchizedek perhaps had had uh, descendants who were carrying on a work uh, so there was something happening in the land of Canaan uh, that one to to whom one could to which one could tithe there was a work taking place uh, a work of God taking place there and Jacob when he came back from the north you know back into the land of Canaan has had promised that you know if, whatever he had he would he would also give a tithe so this ministry perhaps in some form continued and after a while of course it, it you know the Canaanites became more and more corrupt and by the time uh, of the exodus the Canaanites were a, a a people who were setting the worst possible example you can read about how they behaved uh, among other places in Leviticus 18 but we have the Mel the uh, the priesthood of Melchizedek, and it existed before there was a, a, a formal old covenant, and it existed before there was a Levitical priesthood. And in fact, the grandfather of Levi, uh, or the great grandfather of Levi, tithed to uh, to Melchizedek. And in Psalm 110, we find the source of uh, this this what I read to you in Hebrews. We find the, the high priesthood of, of Melchizedek. Psalm 110, uh, this is a psalm of David, and the Eternal said to my Lord, well, uh, whoa, the Messiah is the descendant of David, but he's also David's Lord, because we understand the Messiah is both Davidic and divine. 
So the Messiah is both the uh, descendant of David and the Lord of David, as he is our Lord. A Psalm of David, the Eternal said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Let's jump to verse uh, 4. Yahweh has sworn, the Eternal, Adonai, Hashem, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So he ascends to the heavens and he awaits his return as king of kings and lord of lords, but he is also a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So he supersedes the Levitical priesthood, which came uh, after Melchizedek. He, he supersedes that priesthood. He is the priest, high priest par excellence. And that point is developed further in the book of Hebrews. So Melchizedek is a very wonderful type of Jesus Christ. He is the priest of the Most High God, and he nothing is said about, about his uh, begettal, his birth, nothing is said about his lineage, nothing is said about his birth or death, he's just there. And uh, a type of Jesus Christ, you know, who has no beginning, no end, who is Davidic and divine. He does have a human ancestry, but he also is divine. He's the Logos, God the Son, God the Word. Uh, now, now become the Son of God and resurrected. I, I commented, I covered some of that this morning in a talk I gave at the Flair Congregation at the Flair Church. You might want to check that out on Facebook. I want to go to Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, Melchizedek, and then also, you know, king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, you know, it's not there, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, and made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. So here the type fade, you know, fades into the anti-type, Jesus Christ. Melchizedek is a type of Jesus Christ. And uh, he, he symbolically pictures Jesus Christ's role. I, w as I was studying and found that uh, scholars say there, that there was a, a deity among the Canaanites with the name Tzedek, righteousness. So evidently, uh, one of the gods of the Canaanites was a god who was called righteousness. So one way you could translate Malachi Tzedek is my king is, is Tzedek, my king is righteousness. And so in a way, perhaps the Canaanites in their panoply of gods and goddesses did have one god who was recognized at least by some of them as righteousness. That is to say, a god of moral character a God who made moral demands. You know, if you read about the pagan gods and goddesses, they're powerful figures, but they aren't necessarily figures that ha have a moral code associated with them. You have to pacify them, you know, but they, they aren't necessarily uh, moral beings. Uh, on the other hand, there was a, evidently a God in ancient Canaan who was Tzedek, who was righteousness. So perhaps that was their, somehow, their understanding of the God that we understand as the God of the Bible, Yahweh, who is perfect love, perfect character, who is perfect in every way, and who demands of us that we be moral, who gave us uh, a code of law, uh, and also gave us an enforcement code, uh, which Jesus Christ has now superseded. Fortunately, uh, under Jesus Christ, under the New Covenant, we don't have the, the fines and, and beatings and executions and, and so on that went along with the with the, law, with, the, with the law that God gave. He defined sin, but he also gave an enforcement code, which fortunately for us doesn't apply cause, because Jesus Christ paid that all those penalties for us. So I've said a lot. I've given you a mouthful as far as theology is concerned. And I've only gotten as far as the third verse of Hebrews 7. Would you believe that I was expecting to, uh, to go, through, go through this chapter? So uh, I'm obviously not going to get through it all. <clears throat> but I'm going to uh, cover a little bit of this. Um, verse, um, verse 9. I'm, I'll go to verse 9. As I said even earlier. Even leave, let's, go to, let's go to verse uh, 
7. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by, by the better. In other words, you go to somebody who, in, in effect, is your spiritual elder to be blessed. So in Melchizedek, in a sense, was Abraham's spiritual as elder. He was, he was a priest in a formal way, which Abraham wasn't. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. In other words, Melchizedek was a man, but in the account, he never dies in the account. So he takes on symbolically uh, immortality in that sense. And Jesus Christ indeed is immortal. So when we tithe to God's work today, we're tithing to the immortal high priest, Jesus Christ. And even Levi, verse 9, who receives tithes, pays tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So we see that, which I covered earlier, but I wanted to read about it here. Verse 14, uh, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. You know, the, the, the Judah was the, was the scepter tribe, not the priestly tribe. And, and, and it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there, is a, there, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. So he is not a formal priest under the old covenant, but he supersedes that. He, his priesthood really, uh, in effect, came before there ever was an Abraham. He, he had already been designated as, as to become our high priest, and his high priesthood is forever. I'm, I'm inspired to go to Revelation uh, 13. Uh, I hadn't planned to turn there, but it really does tie in. Revelation 13 and verse... And verse um, Verse, verse 8 is what, is, is what I want. Yeah, Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. This is talking about the Antichrist, you know, who, who, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb. Yes, he's described in the book of Revelation as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But all through the book, he's also described as the lamb. He's the lamb and the lion. He became the lamb, and so he could become the lion. Uh, he is both our high priest and our king. And in verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So he had already prepared to be our high priest before there ever was an Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, Levi, Aaron, Phineas, Zadok, etc. So now I go back to uh, Hebrews 7 and uh, notice that uh, the Psalm 110 is quoted here. Uh, let's go to verse uh, 20. Uh, let's, let's go to verse uh, 20. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath. So the Aaronic priest didn't have, didn't have, it were, didn't become priest with an oath, but Jesus Christ became priest with an oath. So God himself swore, you know, so that's quite a powerful, <laughs> you can't get more powerful than that. He took an oath, God Himself, for they have become priests with they have become priests without an oath, but He with an oath by Him who said to Him, "The the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek." By so much more, Jesus became be, become Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. So we are under the new covenant, a better covenant, and we have a high priest whose priesthood is far greater than the Levitical priesthood, the priesthood of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, our high priest. And so we can think about that. And of course, you could go through this whole chapter 7 of Hebrews, as, and it even goes, of course, into the 8th chapter, which I'm going to read the first verse of. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying, okay? Here we go. Uh, we have still such a high priest, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. 
And I could go further, but I'll, 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 I'll stop this passage at that point. I hope and pray, I hope and pray that I've made it uh, uh, clear enough, and you can go through the material and clarify it more, how, how this Melchizedek, Melchizedek was a type of Jesus Christ and how the book of Hebrews then expounds on that and, and shows us uh, how Jesus Christ is our high priest. And, and bearing that in mind, if you go back to Leviticus 16, uh, as we come, of course, to the Day of Atonement, uh, that will <laughs> perhaps uh, come into your mind in greater, greater, with greater impact. But the rituals of the Day of Atonement, of course, pictures pictured the role of Jesus Christ uh, for, for us, uh, his people, and really for all people ultimately. And I want to go to Hebrews 4. So knowing this, Hebrews 4 tells us this. See, Jesus Christ was it became our high priest, but he went through humanity. He took on humanity, and he, he became a fertilized egg. The Logos, the Word of God, became a fertilized egg in the womb of Mary, went through the birth process, went through childhood, went through young adulthood, uh, conducted a ministry, and then went through the most ignominious kind of, of death. He did all of that. And so... What more can you can, can you ask of a high priest than that? God experienced the worst the worst uh, kind of of human existence, the worst kind of suffering that we, that human beings can can endure. He he, our God, our Creator, endured that. Amazing. It's it's. I, I say amazing. What can I say? Words fail me to talk of such a thing. And uh, in Hebrews four, in verse fourteen, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He lived in the flesh. So he ha he knows, not that he had to do that, but he did it. And so we, you know, we can say he knows by experience. He didn't need the experience, but he went through it. Uh, this shows his love that he, that he did that. So therefore, let's, there's, a, there's, there's a therefore that goes with, with, with what I'm saying. And that's in verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. We can have confidence when we pray because of what God did for us. So let's be confident that you know, God hears us. Look what he did for us. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So let's cultivate our relationship with God during this time of the year. Spring is here, the time of new beginnings. It's the time of self-examination before the uh, Passover season. And so it is a time, if we've been neglecting uh, our prayer and Bible study, to, to get back into spiritual action. And I want to uh, quote an additional verse along those lines in the writings of Peter. I want to go to 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Casting, this is 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You know, this, you know in, in reading the verse just now, it, it comes to mind, you know, the, uh, Peter was a fisherman, and he used nets, but I know fishermen also, well, they throw, when they can't throw out the net, that's, that's called casting. And nowadays, you know, fishermen have a rod and a, and a, a string and a reel, you know, and on and they cast their rod. Well, we should cast our cares upon God. He is, because Jesus Christ is our high priest. Uh, ho the Holy Spirit is omnipotent, and we can come to God through the Son, in the Spirit. We can come to God the Father. And as it says here, uh, I'll go to verse 6 of First Peter 5. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Certainly, Jesus Christ humbled himself, as we read in the book of Philippians. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And that is our, our ultimate destiny, to rule the universe under, under God. Wow. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So let's keep in mind that our coming king is our high priest. So as I said, we're looking forward now to the Springs Festival season 
And as we prepare for it, all the best to you and yours.